Good morning. My name is Dimitri Lascaris. I'm one of seven lawyers in the Coalition for Canadian Accountability in Gaza. We represent two Palestinian Canadians, Hani El Batnigi and Tamar Jarada. Mr. Batnigi is here uh, to my right today. On March 13, 2024, our clients, who have lost dozens of family members to Israel's attacks on Gaza, announced their intention to pursue claims against Canada as a government. Since then, the Canadian government has done nothing to address their pleas. Yesterday, we filed a civil claim on their behalf seeking declarations from the Ontario Superior Court of Justice that Canada has failed to fulfill its duty to take all reasonable measures within its power to prevent genocide and has violated the charter rights of our clients. For more than one year, the world has watched in horror as Israel has perpetrated a genocide in Gaza. Israeli munitions have burned Palestinian refugees alive. Israeli snipers have shot Palestinian children in the head while they were playing in or near their homes. Doctors have been forced to perform amputations on Palestinian children without anesthetic. Palestinian children have been crushed and trapped in collapsed buildings targeted by Israel's Western-supplied bombs. Sometimes no one was able to come to their rescue before they died an agonizing and lonely death. The official death toll for Palestinian children in Gaza now exceeds 16,000. The true number is certainly far higher. The number of Palestinian children who have been disabled, wounded, traumatized, or orphaned is far higher still. For more than one year, Israel has pursued a deliberate policy of depriving Palestinian children of food and water. Doctors in Gaza have revealed to the world images of emaciated babies on the verge of death. The casualty figures I've cited thus far do not come close to telling the full story. In July of this year, the prestigious medical journal The Lancet issued a report in which it estimated the true death toll in Gaza. As the Lancet explained, armed conflicts have indirect health implications beyond the direct harm from violence. Even if the conflict ends immediately, there will continue to be many indirect deaths in coming months and years. In recent conflicts, such indirect deaths range from three to 15 times the number of direct deaths. The Lancet applied a conservative estimate of four indirect deaths per one direct death to the 37,396 official deaths reported at that time, and thereby opined that 186,000 deaths could very well be attributable to Israel's war on Gaza. In a report issued on October 10th, the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory in Israel documented that Israel had perpetrated a concerted policy to destroy Gaza's health care system as part of a broader assault on Gaza. The Commission also investigated the treatment of Palestinian detainees in Israel and of Israeli uh, uh, victims since October 7th and concluded that Israel is responsible for torture and sexual and gender-based violence. There's more. Israel has repeatedly bombed UNRWA-operated schools where the displaced were sheltering. Israel has destroyed the universities of Gaza. Throughout this parade of horrors, Canada's support for Israel has not wavered. Although Justin Trudeau and Melanie Jolie periodically express their grave concern for the plight of Palestinians, not once have they backed up their purported concern with real action. Canada has imposed no meaningful sanctions on Israeli political or military leaders. It continues to allow Canadian citizens to serve in Israel's military. It continues to permit Canadian-made military equipment to be delivered to Israel and even purchases deadly weapons from Israel. Canada also continues to accord trade benefits to Israeli businesses, including those situated in illegal West Bank settlements. Canada continues to accord charitable status to Canadian entities that funnel money to Israel or that are devoted to whitewashing Israel's crimes. On January 26th of this year, the International Court of Justice ruled that it was plausible that Israel is committing genocide within the meaning of the Genocide Convention. On that very day, Canada suspended funding for UNRWA, the main humanitarian agency operating in Gaza. It did so based on allegations by Israel, the perpetrator of this genocide, that a tiny number of lower-level UNRWA employees had participated in the October 7th attacks. Months later, belatedly, Canada restored its funding for UNRWA, but only after the international media revealed that Israel's allegations were not supported by even a shred of credible evidence. Canada has done nothing, emboldening Israel to be more brazen. Israel, in fact, has now designated every major human rights organization in Palestine as a terrorist entity. Today, the world sees clearly that when it comes to the suffering of Palestinians, 
our brothers and sisters in Palestine, Canada has no red line. There's no atrocity Israel can commit that would end Canada's support for Israel. Our clients and all Palestinian Canadians are in effect victims of Canada's anti-Palestinian racism. Confronted by so much pain and so much government indifference to their agony, our clients have decided to seek justice. As stated by former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, sun sunlight is the best disinfectant. Aided by a team of lawyers who are pursuing this litigation on a pro bono basis, Hani and Tamar, our clients, will shine a cleansing light on Canada's indefensible support for Israel's genocidal regime. Moreover, neither they nor their lawyers will cease until Canada has been held accountable. Even if Israel stopped its genocide tomorrow, this litigation will continue. We will not relent. We will not give Canada's government a free pass.